I was at a, a fairgrounds one time during the uh, county fair in Northern California. And as a part of what was going on, they had various booths and vendors and people bustling around. And they were trying to get, in particular, a World War II memorial built in the area. And the guys that were there to raise funds for that were both veterans of World War II. And the one guy I got to talking to, and you know, of course, he had been captured at the beginning of the war. He had lied about his age. He had joined the army at the age of 16. And he got shipped off to the Philippines. And then the Japanese invaded. And he was the youngest man on what they called the Bataan Death March because so many American soldiers died being marched to where they were sending them. So he had gone through some interesting things. And I was kind of picking his brain and, and sitting there listening, you know, because, well, even as a young man, I was a complete nerd. And I wanted to know about the great World War II. And it was interesting because, for one thing, he got out of the army after he had survived the war. And, um, well, he didn't completely get out. He got done and kind of re-upped and then got sent to Korea and got captured. I said, man, you need to find yourself a new profession. And he said, yeah. And I was asking him about the differences and about what he dealt with, you know, in terms of dealing with enemies. And he talked about being in Japan and the fact that even, you know, those, these were their enemies because of the conditions there. He said, you know, we were used as slave labor. And, you know, they kind of kill you as soon as look at you if you did something that they didn't like. And so, like, well, how did you handle that? How did you handle the fact that if they're using you to build a factory that you know is going to build guns, that you know is going to shoot at your friends? What did you do? And he said, well, we resisted in every little way we could. And then he told me this story. He said, you know, we... Uh, we uh, were, were working on this factory, and we were pouring huge cement footings. And we look around, and there's no Japanese supervisors. He said, you know, normally we'd kind of take our time as much as we could, but this time we moved pretty quick. We looked around, there were no Japanese supervisors, there was this huge footing being filled with cement, and there was this gigantic lathe sitting there, you know, the size of a VW bus you know, one of these huge pieces of industrial equipment, and we had a crane. So we looked around, we picked up the lathe with the crane, set it in the footing, kept going about our business, and kept filling the footing up. Supervisors came back in later, the footing was done, and the lathe was missing. And they demanded to know, where's the lathe? So, I don't know. Where's the lathe? What lathe? Where's the lathe? I don't have it. They never did find it. To this day, there's probably a building in Tokyo somewhere with a gigantic industrial lathe in the foundation. Resistance. Enemies sabotaging. Might be a little a bit of a poor example, but we get to the sabotage of the enemy against God, and of course it is a fruitless gesture. As we are continuing in Matthew, we're continuing with Jesus speaking in riddles. He's speaking in riddles because his people have rejected him. And so now the riddles will only be explained to those who have accepted him. Now only those who have trusted in him will know the truth. Because no one else is interested in listening to it. So he'll speak in riddles. And if it piques your interest, you can ask him. It's kind of where we're at. And where we're at is a story of the enemy's action against Christ. Against God. If you would look at verse 24. Jesus has explained the parable of the sower, but now he explains 
a parable of weeds. He uses a lot of the same terms, but they don't all mean the same thing as the last parable. So we have to read through because the explanation is a part of this passage. It says this. He put another parable before them saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat among them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in the measures of flour till it was all leavened. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Then he left the crowds, went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, Explain this to us. <laughs> Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. The other ones were obvious enough that they figured, I think, that they understood. But this one, they're a little murky on. So explain to us what you're saying, please. And he answered. Isn't that the way of God? He is gracious and he answers. So the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them in the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. There's some unpleasant news in this, and there is good news in this. So we go back with Jesus' interpretation, his explanation of what happened. And here we are. The kingdom of heaven, he says in verse 24, may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. He has told us, the one who sows this seed is the son of man. This is Jesus. He is the one sowing seed. Now, in the previous parable, the seed was the word of God. The people were the soil. Here, the soil is simply the world. The kingdom of heaven, as it has come through Christ, can be compared to this. What is this? It is the world in which he has sown his seed. His people. The seed are his people. Did you realize that you have been sown in the field? That you've been planted by God. You've been planted where you're at by God. What an amazing thought. Sometimes what a horrifying thought. Why am I here? Because <laughs> God put you here, but I don't want to be here. Welcome to the party. There are times we love where we're at, right? There are times that we hate where we're at. But we've been placed there by God. We've been sown for a purpose. Now, notice when he jumps into this, he's talking about weeds being sown in. He says, you know, I come, I do my work. 
I sow my seed. He's talking about him planting. He's talking about the work that his apostles will do, planting. That pastors and church leaders and church lay people and Sunday school teachers and children that he is using. His people will sow seed generations after generations down the line. They will be doing his work. So he's talking about all of us. And he says, you know, for the purpose of the parable, because everyone must sleep, right? The field is the world. And while people aren't looking, because they must rest, an enemy is at work. Now, unlike my story earlier where, you know, I was chuckling as I listened to this guy tell the story, and I was kind of laughing. And of course, you know, from my perspective, the one doing the work while the enemy was looking away was the hero. In this case, the enemy, the bad guy, comes in while others are at rest. His purpose, you'll notice, is not to reap his own harvest. His purpose is not to create anything. It is simply to destroy the harvest of the other person. We have a spiritual war around us. And we're so obvious and oblivious to it. And the enemy's purpose is not to create something new. The enemy's purpose is simply to destroy what God has done to taint what God has made. He wants to corrupt the harvest. So he sows weeds. Now the word for weeds here in verse 25 is actually a word that in Greek can be used for basically a poisonous plant that looked like wheat. You're not going to notice it when it's easy to pull. You're not going to notice it with the first sprouts. You're not going to walk down the row and simply pluck them out. No, you're going to notice these when they start coming to fruition, when they are green and tall and their seeds kind of look like wheat. But anyone who knows wheat can see a difference. And now it's hard to simply remove them. The servants ask, should we get rid of this? The master says, don't worry about it. He says, an enemy has done this. So do you want us to go and gather them? Shall we simply get rid of them? He said, no. Lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Wait till the harvest is ready. This is a significant statement for us. Jesus could have, God could have simply rooted up the weeds, established the kingdom, and been done. But he had a plan for the harvest. He had a plan that included you and me. Isn't that an amazing thing? He had a plan for us to bear fruit for us to be a part of his harvest. And so he waits. Sometimes we sit there and we go, why is God waiting so long? I'm already saved. Let's get this over with. That's not the plan. The plan is to wait until the harvest is ready. And you'll notice who the harvesters are. This is a little bit of a statement of end times. So we have some verses in the Bible that sometimes get confused a little bit. There is a verse later on that refers to, and most of us have heard this verse, two people being in the field and one being taken. Two people being out working, one disappearing and one remaining. In the blink of an eye, this happening. And oftentimes, we attribute that verse to something like the rapture. 
but actually what that is talking about is it's talking about the Lord's return at the end. And it's not talking about him taking the saved from among the people of the world. It's talking about him taking the people of the world from among the saved. When Christ returns and he establishes his thousand-year kingdom, for those of us who are pre-tribulational, pre-millennial, all those big fancy words, we believe that Christ will return and he will reign for a literal thousand years. For those of us who believe in that, who see that in scripture, when we look at Revelation, we realize that at the end of that thousand years, it says that the people of the earth will rebel. They will revolt one last time and then Christ will truly establish a new heaven, a new earth, and it will be done. It is a disturbing thought to realize that the people who will revolt at the end of that thousand years are the children of Christians. Because the people of the world will have been thinned from the world. The people who have not trusted Christ will have been removed. This is what he is predicting. And he says, he who has ears, let him hear, because this is a free gift offered to all. To avoid the judgment. To avoid being a part of that thinning. To be part of the harvest. This is an amazing passage, really. Christ tells us what to expect. He says, the weeds will be in amongst you. The church will have those in it that are not of Christ. It's a crazy thing to think about. Now, you can react to this a couple of different ways. You can react as a person who starts walking around going, I don't like you, you're a weed. I don't like you, you're a weed. I don't like you, you're a weed. <laughs> Look in the mirror, buddy. <laughs> Because the person doing that might very well be a weed. <laughs> Here's the issue. And it's not that I don't know what I am, right? It's that there are those who will deceive themselves and will deceive others. It's impossible for us. We're not the servants in this passage. We're not the ones who are supposed to thin it out. We're the harvest. You'll notice the angels will sort that one out. It's not our job to assign to people whether or not they're a believer or an unbeliever, whether or not they're a hypocrite or genuine. It's our job to bear fruit. It's our job to grow well. Now, there are times in the church, Paul gave us some examples says something's going wrong something's rotten in Denmark as they used to say you know using your Shakespearean quotations something's off okay it's appropriate for us to approach sin and say that's wrong that shouldn't be in the church it's appropriate for us to say hey what you're doing is wrong and I have concern for you it's appropriate for us to hold each other accountable that way and to care for each other. But you'll notice that's a whole world different from going, you're a weed and I'm going to pluck you. Well, it's not your job to pluck anything. You're wheat. God will eventually harvest you. It's your job to bear fruit. It's my job to bear fruit. See, there's a whole different attitude towards it here. Understand that when we look at this, our job is simple. He's telling us what's going to happen. He's telling us how it's going to happen. And he said, the kingdom is like this. He's saying what's happened already. Until the end of time. Until Christ returns and establishes things the way they ought to be. The wheat and the weeds will grow together. It's our job to bear fruit. And when it's time, the angels will harvest. The angels will remove. But let's have ears and let's hear. Here's a warning. Be genuine. Don't deceive yourself. 
Don't deceive yourself that you are good in and of yourself, that attending church gets you where you need to go. The directing the church gets you where you need to go. There are a lot of people who think that because they run the church, they're doing something good for God. Newsflash, you don't run the church. There are a lot of weeds that have taken root in important places and important times and tried to run things. They've deceived themselves. I'm doing this in God's name. No, you're doing it for yourself. So we got to be careful. We must be genuine. But here's the deal. If you're worrying that you're a weed, you're probably not. The person who is the person of the enemy is a person who is completely unconcerned with what God has to think about things. The person who is the wheat is the person who is bearing fruit because they are concerned about what God has to say about things. Don't let this be a matter of concern to you where you sit and worry about this. Am I really a Christian? I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. If I know in whom I believe, I don't need to worry about whether or not I'm a believer. I need to worry about following him. That's my concern. I don't need to worry about my eternal security. I worried about that plenty when I was a younger man. I grew up the poster child of Awana, oh, good little homeschool child. Actually, I went to public high school, even. But you know, I tell people I had the, the trifecta. I was homeschooled, I was Christian schooled, and I was public schooled. I loved homeschool, I loved being around the heathens. The only thing I didn't like was Christian school. <laughs> Who likes eighth grade anyway? But here's the deal. I worried about my salvation because I could see sin in my life. And I'm like, if I'm saved, I shouldn't be doing this, right? If I'm saved, this shouldn't be a problem for me, right? If I'm saved, except, what was the problem? I was putting it back on me and not on the Savior in whom I trust. So start with that. It's about the Savior in whom you've trusted. And don't worry about this being a tale of whether or not you need to worry about being a wheat or a weed. It's about telling the wheat there will be weeds. And God will thin it out in the end. That's the story here. If you look at the last two parables, they were very short. The disciples didn't ask about these things. They figured they understood, I think. Kingdom of heaven being compared to a grain of mustard seed. The tiniest seed you can find. If you've ever seen a mustard seed, the thing's almost microscopic. Now, it doesn't grow into a tree. If you think of an oak tree, when you think of this term tree, that's, that's not the picture. But you think about walking through a well-tended garden. You have multiple raised beds around you. You have plants of varying sizes. Oh, that's a nice tomato plant. You know, that's a, that over there is a, a really nice cucumber. We can make some pickles with that thing. And at the end, there's this giant bush. And the bird is so big that birds can nest in the branches of it. Where did that one come from? You know, unlike this, which came from a starter plant, or this one that came from a big old seed, it came from that little tiny mustard seed. Something that other people would consider insignificant, and now it's one of your most significant plants in the garden. That's what he's talking about. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Can you see leaven inside of flour. Once it's mixed in, you can't tell a difference, you can't see, but as it's left, it rises. The kingdom will mature. 
until the time is right. Jesus has given the explanation, and he ends with those words, you as ears, let him hear. There is judgment, never what we consider good news, and yet at the same time what we long for sometimes, right? As long as it doesn't come for us. As long as it comes for the other guy. <laughs> you know, I know some people who really need some judgment. Lord, please bring it soon. No, his, his comment to these guys is the judgment will come in its time. The angels will be the instruments. God will do what he will do. And in the meantime, bear fruit. Don't be a weed. Bear fruit. What a wonderful thing. Isn't it awesome to have one job and know that it's not the hardest job in the book? We don't have to, we don't have to judge. We don't have to be the instrument of taking care of everything else. We need to bear fruit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? There are a couple of different lists given different places. But there are a lot of things that are similar over and over again in what we're commanded to do. Show love. Have joy. Rest in the peace of God. Be kind. Be gentle. Not always my strongest suit. Love one another. Bear with one another. All those things. The fruit that we're supposed to bear. Tell others of the gospel. That they may be saved. Oftentimes I think he gives us warnings of judgment so one, we can avoid it. By trusting in him. Two, so that we will tell others that they may avoid it by trusting in him. Three, so that we will know that God in the end is just. But really, again, the point, bear fruit. As we uh, go through the different summer ministries and the things coming up, opportunities to share with each other, opportunities to grow, opportunities to reach out in the community, Ideally, we should be doing one thing and all of those things. The same thing you should be doing in your daily life. Bear fruit. How do you bear fruit? Jesus' disciples, in a way, are, are sitting there asking that question. Indeed, the, the entirety of the word is an explanation of who God is, how we can know him, and what it means to bear fruit spend your entire life studying it. So you should get started. You know. We should be doing this. Let's close in a word of prayer and um, commit this to the Lord.